that. Um, I like to be rather punctual, so if anyone is late, they'll just trickle in. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. My name is Bettina Hess. I'm the librarian here at the German Society, and um, I see many familiar faces and a few new faces and family members, so welcome. Um, we're happy to have um, Jocelyn McDaniel here as our uh, Gunter Fink Memorial lecture, uh, lecturer this evening. Um, I wanted to make a couple of announcements before we start. Um, uh, just a couple of plugs for the library. Um, the first is to mention um, some of the programs we have going on at the library, um, one of which is our Adopt-a-Book program. Um, we have a program set up where we are um, identifying books in our collection that we think could use a little bit of uh, extra care because the conditions have worn them down, they've been used a lot, or they have uh, somehow fallen apart. So we have a program whereby you can um, adopt a book and that will pay for the restoration of that volume. Um, so uh, to date, we uh, I think we have had about 150 books that have been adopted and preserved, which is wonderful. Um, we have a book restorer who lives in Philadelphia, and um, every once in a while when we have enough books, we bring them to her and she does her magic on them, and then we have beautiful books to put back on the shelves. Right now we have two um, catalogs that are on the website. Um, our fall catalog was based on a treasure tour we had here in the fall, and that was focused on 19th century popular science books, including mesmerism and somnambulism and all sorts of interesting topics. Um, and the winter catalog is uh, focused on literature and the works that were um, discussed in Andrea Wolff's novel, um, and not novel, a book, um, now I'm blanking on it, The Magnificent Rebels. Um, so both of those have had some books adopted, but there are still others available. So if you're interested, I have the catalogs here. I'm going to put them on the back table. Um, but they're also available on our website um, to look at. Um, and I also wanted to announce a couple of upcoming events. On May 7th, we're going to be having a treasure tour hosted by our own Maria Sturm. And the title of the tour will be The Silence of the Archives, a look at the German society records from the 1930s to the 1950s. Um, on May 19th, we are going to be having Virta Flager offer a uh, talk on the charitable works of the Women's Auxiliary, and that will be on Zoom. Um, the treasure tour will be on a Saturday from, in the afternoon from 2 to 3, and the Zoom talk will be on a Friday at 12.30. So if you're interested, those will be um, listed on the, on the website as well. Um, now I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, I want to thank Jocelyn McDaniel for coming tonight. And the uh, title of her talk is Science and Survival, Translating and Curating the Papers of George and Max Breidig. Jocelyn is the research curator for the Breidig Project at the Science History Institute here in Philadelphia. Um, her responsibilities include translating and curating the German language papers of the German Jewish scientists Georg and Max Breivik. She most recently curated the exhibit Science and Survival for the Archive, which is on display at the Science History Institute through April of, so, it was soon, uh, April of this year. Um, Dr. McDaniel holds a PhD in German studies from the University of Maryland at College Park, a BA and an MA in German literature from the University of Delaware, and an MA in European Cultural History from the Universität des Saarlandes. She has also taught German courses at the University of Maryland since uh, 2012 as an adjunct professor. And we got to know Jocelyn when she joined our transcription group here um, for a little bit last year, which was um, to help her with the project she's working on, and we'll talk to us about tonight. So, Jocelyn. everyone and welcome to our uh, talk this evening. Thank you so much for attending. Um, my name is Jocelyn McDaniel um, and I'm delighted to discuss my work with you this evening on the Braden Archive. In 2019, the Science History Institute um, acquired the papers of Georg and Max Braden with the help of the Braden family. 
Um, and I'd like to show a few examples from our collection. So this is uh, just some, some examples that we have from the papers that span over two centuries. So it's quite a, a magnificent collection. Um, they contain um, a trove of correspondence, photographs, and other documents belonging to German Jewish father and son chemists, Georg and Max Brady. Um, their survival and discovery are exceptional given that similar items were usually lost during the Holocaust. From 2019 to 2022, the papers were archived and digitized in the Othmer Library at the Science History Institute. And for the past two years, from 2021 to 2023, I've been honored to work at the re as the research curator to translate them from German to English and bring the Breitig scientific accomplishments and remarkable story of survival to light. The archive can be viewed against two backdrops, pre and post 1933. So I'd first like to introduce you to the materials pre-1933. So the materials before 1933 document Georg Breitig's, um, okay. <laughs> uh, document Georg Breitig's um, noteworthy scientific career in physical chemistry in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, particularly his contributions to catalysis and founding of the Breitig arc method, as well as his international collaborations. Many of his correspondents were also groundbreaking scientists and Nobel laureates. Some of these included Svante Arrhenius, and Arrhenius was a really interesting figure because he helped to found the Nobel Institutes in Stockholm and was actually a father of the Nobel Prize for Physics um, as we know it today. Uh, Wilhelm Oswald, who was Breitig's doctoral advisor and mentor, Fritz Haber, and Max Planck. On this slide, I share some of my favorite pieces of correspondence from this time frame. So the first is a postcard from uh, Svante Arrhenius, written in 1911, and it was written from a scenic, um, with a, on a scenic postcard from Stockholm. And I actually, we have many um, examples of this postcard um, in the back, so if you, if you really like this postcard and would like to take one home, I actually have a few in the back for, for you to take. Um, so Arrhenius was a Swedish scientist and Nobel Prize winner himself, who made significant contributions to the fields of physical chemistry, thermodynamics and atmospheric science. And I was actually pleased to learn today from one of my colleagues who works with Swedish that um, Svante Arrhenius was actually a, like a grand uncle of um, the, one of the um, Greta Thunberg, I think is her name. Yeah, so there is a, quite an a interesting connection there to the 21st century. Uh, now, Breitig and Arrhenius worked on electric, ele electrolytic disassociation together and became lifelong friends. Now the second correspondence item is a thank you note from Max Planck, which was written in 1918. Now Planck was the German physicist who is considered one of the most important figures in the development of modern physics, and is best known for his groundbreaking work on the concept of energy quantization. Now the third was one of my favorites. Um, this is accolades from Margareta von Rangel. Now uh, Rangel was a German agricultural chemist and the first woman in Germany to hold a professorship in natural science. Now, in 1923, she was appointed um, a full professor in plant nutrition in Hohenheim. Oh, um, although she did, we don't know from the archive if she actually had any direct communication between Rommel and, um, and Breitig, although I suppose they did, but um, Gary Breitig really marveled at her work, and he often mentions her books in his letters to his son Max. And in this letter right here, he actually recommends her book, which he calls Das Rommel but um, she wrote a few, a few books on um, chemistry as well, so in addition to plant science. And then the last um, is a postcard from Japan from one of Gary Breitig's um, colleagues, Yukichi Osaka, and he had actually worked with um, Gary Breitig in Wilhelm Oswald's laboratory in Leipzig. Um, so this postcard shows the sweep of Gary Breitig's international collaborations. So um, Gary Brady was quite a magnificent person because he had many international collaborations as well as diverse friendships with colleagues from around the world and that would eventually help him survive much later. Now, um, on slide four, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the materials after 1933. Um, now in the archive, these show how both Gary Brady and his son Max Brady took advantage of their extensive scientific network to escape Germany um, of note, in this particular part of the archive is correspondence relating to Max Breitig's courageous endeavors, both independent and collaborative, to help his family and friends in Europe once he was safe in the USA. Now, Max Breitig, who I'll talk a little bit more about in just a minute, was Georg Breitig's son. He was also a chemist. 
and he was able to leave Germany in 1937 with the help of a colleague, so I'll explain who that is in just a minute, but um, both father and son were able to take advantage of this extensive um, international network that they had. Now on this slide are stations of the Brady family's flight, people who assisted them, or notable artifacts pertaining to their survival story. Uh, this is the, the picture on the top uh, right. This is the Technische Hochschule Karlsruhe, and this is where Georg Breitig taught for the majority of his career from 1911 to 1933. Um, down below, this is one of my favorite, I really enjoyed learning about this place, this is the Van Hoff Laboratory. Um, so Jakob Van Hoff was a Dutch chemist, and he was one of Georg Breitig's colleagues. And when Georg Breitig was getting ready to leave uh, Europe, he actually stored his library in the Van Hoff Laboratory. And the Van Hoff Laboratory kept the um, library for him until 1946. And by that time, Georg had unfortunately passed, but his library was sent returned to his son in New York. Um, now, to, uh, in the middle, this is a picture of Krasimir Fayans. Um, now, Krasimir Fayans was a Polish chemist, but he worked extensively in Germany at the University of Munich. Um, he was once a student of Georg Breitig, and when he became a professor himself, he became a mentor to Georg's son, Max, and would eventually help Max um, acquire a position at the University of Michigan. So, Krasimir Fayans is um, about, we call him a major player in the archive because we, he comes up not only in Peter Grade's early career but also in the career of Max Grade. Um, I also showed the SS Nyasa, which was the ship that Gear Grade's daughter and son in law took from, uh, from Marseille to the United States. So in 1941, when they fled Europe to the United States. And the SS Nyasa um, has quite a long history of um, trans transporting uh, refugees from Europe to the United States. Um, I also um, have a brochure from the self-help organization. So this was an interesting organization um, because Max Breitig used them to transfer money to his relatives in uh, Germany and France throughout the late 1930s and early 1940s. And then uh, last but not least is the Daniel C. Research Institute on the bottom left as it looks today. So it's been remodeled over the last eight years or years, um, but they still have the original sign there in uh, what was then British Palestine. And um, Gary Breidig um, sent his library, parts of his library, which were not stored in the Van Hoff Laboratory, to the Daniel C. Research Institute in um, what is today Israel. Um, so I'd like to go to our next slide on slide five um, and contextualize a little bit about um, how we work to bring the archive to the public domain. So I'd like to talk a little bit about digital humanities. Um, it's a relatively new field that emerged in this century and it combines traditional humanities disciplines with computational methods and tools to analyze and comprehend cultural artifacts like we have uh, several letters so our um, field would be mostly history and the uh, history of science, um, cultural artifacts, and phenomena. And within this framework, our goal for the Brady Archive was to make the Brady family story more accessible to the wider public by digitizing and translating 1,100 documents from German into English. So we've since discovered many more documents, which we're still working on as we kind of uh, complete the Brady project in 2023. Um, but we had uh, kind of a multifaceted team working on this project. So we had a digital librarian who, um, and a, a, a digital technician who digitized the archive. We also had an archivist who initially archived um, the collection once it was received in 2019. And then I um, translated the documents as well as curated them. Um, so for those of you who work with the German language, it's known that translating German to English, particularly the older scripts, can be challenging yet a fulfilling experience. It's particularly, particularly satisfying to unravel the mysteries of a handwritten document and piece together its meaning. Oh, um, uh, this, I chose this letter because it's from Max Planck, but it's also written in current shift. Um, now, in the Breitig Archive, we had many documents from the late 19th and early 20th century written in current. Um, and can I just ask how many people are familiar with current script? Okay, so many people are, are, are quite knowledgeable of the script. Um, but for those who might not be knowledgeable or familiar with the script, um, 
like I was when I first started with the Breitig project. It's a um, used in German-speaking countries from the Middle Ages until the 20th century. Um, it's recognized for its cursive, flowing appearance, and the use of specific letter shapes and connecting strokes. Current was used for both handwriting and printing, and it was the primary script of German language books, documents, and correspondence until the early 20th century. Um, it was gradually replaced by the Latin alphabet. And what's really been interesting for me as a, as a Germanist was to see this transition in the Breitig archives. So um, I, had, I had been uh, used to reading books in kind of older block uh, print, so I was familiar with that, but not the current. And it's interesting for me to see the change in how people write. So sometimes we have multiple writers who start off writing in current, but then maybe 20 years later, they're writing with the Latin script. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting to see Max Planck as one example. Um, I believe the thank you card that I showed you earlier um, is written with Latin script on the back. So in this letter, though, he writes in current. Um, so uh, when I first began my translation work, as I mentioned before, I wasn't initially familiar with the script, and I have taken courses since to learn the script, um, but I'm grateful to the German Society. I attended a workshop here last spring that was wonderful um, and helped me get started with learning the current script. I also have a book that I've been practicing with, um, and I'm grateful as well to my colleague Kucher, who translated many, or transcribed many of these documents for me to translate. Um, I'd also like to mention some other interesting aspects of the translation process. So the correspondence included various handwriting styles from numerous individuals. So we had many scientists, we also had a lot of um, personal correspondence among family members and friends, and all of them had their own, just as in any language, um, unique handwriting style. And sometimes it took me quite a, quite a while to learn. I also encountered various language styles such as scientific language, colloquial terms, and archaic language, which required further research. So in addition, I came across dialects. So in our dialects, uh, in our archive, we actually have a couple letters written in Schwedish. So um, that it was, took some, some research and asking friends in Germany, what does this word mean, what does this word mean? And it usually came from uh, Pierre Breitig's daughter, Mariana, and she would write to her brother, uh, Jungul, <laughs> Leave as you will, and it took, took me just a couple times of reading the letter to understand that that was her um, term, her affectionate term for her brother. Um, so now I would like to introduce you to the Breitig family. Um, so Georg Breitig, um, who uh, lived from 1868 to 1944, was a German physical chemist and a professor of chemistry at the University of Heidelberg, the ETH in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, and I'll stop for a minute just in, um, at, in ETH Switzerland. So Georg Breitig actually worked there for just one year, but it turned out to be a very pivotal year in his life. He not only met um, Albert Einstein, but he also established many connections that he would use later in his life. Um, and then after his tenure, his short tenure in Switzerland, he went to the Technical University of Karlsruhe, or as it was known, the Technische Hochschule Karlsruhe, um, and today it's known as the KTU, I believe, but it's a very, very well-known research um, institution in Germany. Um, and he did research in catalysis and colloidal chemistry. Um, so Georg Breitig was retired in 1933, and he fled Germany in 1940. And one thing that is really interesting about Georg Breitig is we see both his professional writing as well as his personal writing. Um, and and, as, and when I think of myself as the translator, um, he comes across as a very warm and sincere individual. So his, he's always concerned about individuals. He always gives advice to his colleagues and friends, as well as to his son, Max. So um, his son, Max Brady, um, was also a chemist. Uh, so Max lived from 1902 to 1977. And um, he followed in his father's footsteps. Um, and Georg often writes to Max about professional recommendations, and Max definitely used his father's professional network to help him in, with different positions. Um, so he worked um, in Germany, he worked at the University of Munich in the lab of Casimir Fions, and also at the Bavarian Nitrogen Works in Berlin. Now he eventually left uh, Germany in 1937, and when he was in the USA, he worked at the University of Michigan for the Vanadium Corporation of America, and at the Oak Ridge Laboratory in Tennessee. So uh, what's interesting about Max, though, is he also
also worked in catalysis, um, and he worked mostly with molten salts. And there's actually, um, are there any scientists in the room? Oh, you know the chemistry. Well, there is a mineral actually named after um, uh, Max Breidig. It's called Breidigite. So he's, he was well known um, for his research at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and he worked specifically with molten salts and contributed a lot to the discovery of Breidigite. Um, so he helped his family um, throughout the late 1930s and early 1940s um, flee Germany um, through numerous humanitarian endeavors which I'll talk about once uh, we get to our exhibit in just a minute. Um, now, Rosa Brady was um, Georg's wife, Max's mom, um, and when I first started, um, Rosa's voice was very quiet. We didn't have many letters from Rosa. There were some mentions of her, and she always came across with terms of endearment, but uh, last summer, we actually discovered about 10 letters from Rosa, um, so we got to hear her voice as a mother. So. Her, most of the letters that we have in the archive are from a short time span in the summer of 1927, where she's writing to her son Max, giving him professional advice and kind of trying to be just a mom. So she's uh, mm -hmm. kind of comes across as just very sincere and warm as well. Um, now, Mariana Hamburger was Eric Radig's daughter, and she worked as a primary school teacher and seamstress. Um, she, um, in the archive, we have many of Mariana's. Uh, correspondence from Gers, the Gers camp in France. Um, she and her husband Victor were both there for nine months in 1940. Uh, now when she arrived in the United States, she lived in New York City for the rest of her life. And then Victor Hamburger was uh, Mariana's husband, and he was a banker. And he eventually worked for the self-help organization in New York City. So it was very interesting because Max Breidig had used the self-help organization, and then later um, Victor, his brother-in-law, would eventually work there as an accountant. So that is the, the Brady family. And now um, I'd like to introduce you to our exhibit, More Science and Survival. So from October tw uh, 2022 to April of 2023, so this month we actually have just a few more weeks left um, of our outdoor exhibit. It runs until April 25th. Um, we have hosted an exhibit at the Science History Institute called Science and Survival, which documents the overarching theme of communication throughout the papers of Georg and Max Breidig. These include letters and postcards, conveying scientific matters, professional family correspondence, and more modern methods of quick communication, such as telegrams and radiograms to facilitate humanitarian efforts during the Holocaust. So for me, it was quite interesting um, having grown up in the late 20th century and into the 21st century to see some of these methods of quick communication. So I had always known what a telegram was, but uh, I think when we first started in June of 2021, we had a whole stack of something called radiograms. So that was quite interesting for us to learn what a radiogram was. And then um, basically it's very similar to a telegram, but just sent using radio waves. Um, so we have several of those uh, from the Brady family. Um, so when I was planning the exhibit, I chose to focus on the extensive documentation pertaining to the Braidic family's astounding survival story. Um, so the artifacts that I chose for the exhibit are paired with the individual who composed the correspondence item, and we chose to focus on the short time span from 1937 to 1941. Now, I'd like to show you some of the artifacts that we have in our Science and Survival exhibit. And they're also available online, so I'll give you that website at the end in case you'd like to see the exhibit yourself um, on, at home on your computer. Um, so our first um, example is a letter from Georg Grady to the Daniel C. Research Institute. Um, this little letter really um, just drew me in for some reason. I, as a translator, a historian, also a, just a, um, I'm just very interested in this letter, and I think out of the whole collection, it's the one that has stayed with me the most. Um, so this is a letter from Gary Grady, written on May 21st, 1937, to the uh, Daniel C. Research Institute in British Palestine. So Grady feared that his library might be destroyed and offered to donate parts of it to the institute, which also housed some works of his colleague Fritz Haber. So the Daniel C. Research Institute was established in 1934 by Kaim Weizmann. Um, he was a Russian-born biochemist, and he was also a Zionist, and he would become Israel's first president. 
So the Daniel Seek Research Institute was eventually renamed the Weizmann Institute of Science in his honor in 1949. And originally when I came across this specific letter, I wasn't sure if the Weizmann Institute still had it, so we're still trying to determine if uh, Braddock's library actually ended up there, but it was really interesting that, that he um, endeavored to do this and actually sent the library. So we, it's kind of one of the mysteries of the archive that we, we'd like to find out one day. Now our second artifact in the exhibit is a radiogram. This is from Gary Braddock to Max Braddock. So originally, Georg Braddock did not want to emigrate from Germany. So, um, however, he stayed there for about seven years. So he was retired in 1933, um, and he he just really loved Germany. He, was, he always mentions how proud he was of Germany. So he just, just decided to stay. Um, but things began to get really um, worse throughout the 1930s, and he knew he had to leave. So as he was preparing to leave, his son worked to help find a position for him, and it resulted in a pro forma lectureship at Princeton University. So in this radiogram, which is like a telegram but sent via radio, sent on January 14, 1940, Georg tells his son Max that he has sent his documents to Princeton University and that he should be leaving Europe for the United States soon. So uh, Georg's journey from Germany to the United States was quite long, and at the time he was almost 70, and as he writes in his letters, it was a very exhaustive journey. He didn't have a lot of money at that point, um, and he was hosted by one of his colleagues, Ernst Cohen, in Amsterdam. So he left in 1939 from Germany, he had a visa, and he went to Amsterdam where he waited to depart to New York from, from from there, but he was there for about three months in the Netherlands, and there are many telegrams and radiograms from that time period. Um, so our third item is the Air Freight Immigrant Identification Card for the United States. Um, and this was interesting for me because it shows Georg Freitag's full name. So Georg Freitag was born in uh, Glogau, in what was then, um, what is today modern Poland, but then Silesia. And his full name was uh, Solomon Julius Georg Freidig, but he chose to go by the name of uh, Georg Freidig. Um, so our next uh, artifact is a letter from Mariana and Victor Homberger to Georg and Max Freidig. And um, this for me was, was quite an interesting letter because it's, it has multiple writers. So what, one thing I've discovered in the Braidic Archive is people like to write letters together, and they often write in the margins as well, so a lot of marginalia. Um, and when I first saw this letter, or actually when we first saw this letter, we didn't know it was written from both Mariana and her husband to her father and brother. But once we were able to decipher and kind of make out what they were writing, uh, we understood um, that they were describing their, that they had just been freed from the Gers camp. So they had been in the Gers camp for about nine months, and they were released with Max's help, and then they went to Marseille to wait for their trip to the United States. So in this letter, they describe just the, kind of the feelings of freedom, relief. Um, they also talk about other people in Gers and friends, um, and they can't wait to join their family in the United States. So the uh, last few um, artifacts. Um, this is a telegram sent from Max Breidig to Mariana Hamburger, and he writes that he has secured ship fares for them to New York on the SS Niasa. And then um, our next uh, artifact was this kind of, um, we call it a, kind of a separate facet of the archive, and it has its own theme as well. Um, so this is a Red Cross letter from Alfred and Ava Schnell to Max Breidig. So in 1936, the International Red Cross began setting up a message service to allow immigrants to stay in touch with relatives and friends who were still in Germany or have been deported. This is a Red Cross message from Max Gradig's former colleague, the chemist Alfred Schnell, and his wife Ava to Max Gradig. Um, in the 1940s, Alfred and his wife Ava uh, fled Berlin to the Netherlands. And in their messages to Max Gradig, they used aliases, including Arthur and Erna Dahlem, Arthur and Ellen Escaper, and Alfred and Eva Quick. Now, what was interesting for me when they first started um, 
they, I guess, didn't understand what the aliases meant, and I was able to tell them that Schnell meant biker fast. So they kind of translated a lot of their German, um, their German names into English. Um, and also, what's really interesting about their um, Red Cross letters is they're written in both um, English and German as well. So there came a point when they were writing in German, and from what we understood from the archive, is it was seen as suspicious to write in German after a certain point, so they began writing in English at that point. Um, so for, for us, that the Red Cross letters are very unique and kind of represent a, kind of a separate part of the archive. Now, um, our last artifact in the archive, this is a photograph of Max and Lydia Brady. Now, Max eventually married um, uh, in the United States, and his wife Lydia was a lawyer from New York. Um, so this is Max and Lydia Brady with Mariana and Victor Hamburger in Colorado, um, circa the 1940s. Um, and it's very poignant. There's an inscription, inscription on the back which reads, Happy Ending. So overall, um, in my work on uh, the Brady Archive, I have learned that many stories may never be known because trauma and loss prevent many from ever being told. And for me, what was really interesting was the Braidic Archive and its just uniqueness overall. Um, and it was held by Georg's grandson, George, until 2018, when it was then acquired by the Science History Institute. Um, so with this exhibit and the archive and digitization and translation process, we hope to give voice to the Braidic family's story and scientific uh, contributions. So in closing, I'd like to thank everyone, especially my colleagues at the Science History Institute who I worked with. We had um, many collaborations over the past four years, um, as well as all, everyone who was interested in our archive. We had a lot of inquiries, so I, I was just delighted to be able to share what I learned and share um, just the great story with everyone who, who asked about them. Um, and thank, I thank the German Society as well for allowing us to talk about the, the great archive tonight. So thank you very much, and I'd be glad to answer any questions.
So especially for some of the scientific documents, they explain in, in, in brief what what the letter pertains to. Translated by the time the project ends, and I, what will happen to those? I think so. Um, we tried to translate uh, within that two-year time frame most of the letters, although some of Gaelic Greek letters, especially, are very, very long. <laughs> they can be up to eight to ten pages, uh, so those require a lot of, of work. Um, but we, I think we've translated about ninety-five percent of the documents, but there might be about maybe forty that are still left to translate. So people who want to use the collection will just have to learn how to read this correct <laughs> themselves. <laughs> and what's, what's also interesting is we, we acquired later the next year um, the papers of Max Breidig. So these are all of Max Breidig's papers that are kind of separate from his father's. And most of those are in English, which is helpful. Um, although some of them, like from his childhood, are written in German. So when I first looked at them, um, they were postcards written in the 1910s, and I just I remember looking at them and just taking a whole day to read through them, and I was just, it was really interesting for me to read those, and I, was like, I really hope we can translate those one day. Did you say these were acquired from the grandson? Is that correct? Yes. Um, 
Um, so the uh, Gaylord Gradig's grandson, or Max Gradig's son, um, who uh, kept the, the family papers until 2018. And then he actually did, I, from what I understand, they didn't know the kind of the significance. Um, and then um, and it, it came to the Science History Institute. That's fine. has no basis that many of these German scientists intentionally foil some of Hitler's projects. And I wonder if you came across a shadow of a hint that people like Heisenberg and Niels Bohr might have used their American colleagues to get help. Um, what is that your next question? Oh, <laughs> from, from what I understand is Georg Friedrich was well, there was the kind of the, they call them the, the founders of physical chemistry. Um, so there was Fritz Haber, who was also working, um, especially in, in the First World War, and he's a little bit controversial for some of his, his methods that he used during the war, but nonetheless, he was a, a, a really renowned scientist. Um, so some of like Albert Einstein, he, they're mentioned in, in the archive, but I don't think Georg Brady um, worked with them on that type of level. I guess some of the, like when I think right away, some of the most famous scientists that he corresponded with was probably Max Planck. Um, the other was Fritz Haber, um, who unfortunately he passed away in 1835. Nothing with Niels Bohr. I understand. Although, what's uh, interesting, Max Brady, he became a scientist kind of in his own right in the United States. And Max, in his letters to his father, in the late 1930s from the United States, he mentions meeting a lot of these scientists um, in the United States. And I think one of the most interesting letters for me was he, he talks about taking this trip to uh, um, Princeton, New Jersey. So he, he, that's where he would eventually um, to get a perform a position for his father. And he actually did meet um, Albert Einstein. And from what I understood from the letter, Georg knew Albert Einstein. So it almost seemed like they kind of knew each other, but it didn't become, it doesn't, it's not really mentioned in the archives, I would say. There's kind of hints here and there. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Dawson. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can you? Easily?